I buy that for a dollar. <laughs> that was a terrible part of that movie. Well, but that's what everybody remembers. I know. <laughs> this is actually a pretty good satire because they're making fun of dystopia to a degree. And Paul Verhoeven does a lot of almost satirical things. That some people think that Starship Troopers might be satire. So, In the dystopia, he predicted that we would be uh, inundated with horrible comedy. So you're experiencing it right here, right now. Uh, yeah, idiocracy comedy. Yeah. Remember, the movie was just ass. Mm -hmm. The top movie. Welcome, everybody. This is Jay and Jamie, and we are doing our... Episode 2 of Dystopian Films. Tell us what uh, our films are tonight in the first half for the beloved public. Uh, tonight we got Blade Runner. Classic movie. Um, the Island. Snowpiercer. And Robocop. Which, watching Robocop made me want to add Starship Troopers to the dystopia list. Because that happens in the future. So... Yeah, do we know the do date? That. I think I looked it up. Uh, yeah, we do. 27th century. <laughs> 20. <laughs> yeah. Obviously 2700s. So, um, this is a kind of a low, it's a Friday night at 9 p.m. Is everybody out getting their uh, stabbies tonight? Is it a stabby party? Are they getting uh, butt swabs? I mean, what, what the heck, dude? I don't think we've ever had 75 concurrent viewers on a live stream so i'm thinking that we're we've been put maybe into the the tristan bin well this is YouTube. huh this is youtube we've I... never had 78 so i know we've never had 78 you don't, you don't understand what yeah, i'm saying yeah people are leaving youtube right i don't i don't know about that but thank you Rybranium. He sends a little bit of a donation. We'll get to these donations in a moment, but uh, maybe some of these nerds will pile in here. I mean, excuse me, but what else is there to do on a um, Friday night? Nothing. Why are you not here? They'll come. You can't. There's nothing else When they else see how do. much fun we're having, they will come. I'm not having fun now. I'm mad. Nobody's uh, here. It's time to quit. <laughs> we have we're, we're, uh, we're washed up stars now. We're going to we're gonna have to go on some kind of VH1 uh rehab celebrity rehab show because we're all washed up now live in a house with other youtubers who are yeah exactly done with right uh tristan <laughs> living in a tristan mud hut down in ecuador yeah uh, celebrity rehab mud hut starring tristan andy warski who else has a washed up youtube does pewdiepie still do stuff i don't know he's too big for us though oh so. Back. Welcome everybody. If you would hit like and share, please support the show. As you know, I think everybody should like these movies. Everybody's requested RoboCop for so many years, and we finally got to it. So here we are. We're going to well, do it. This is the area of time which is right on top of us. So like Blade Runner 2019, that was supposed to happen two years ago. Like there was already replicants two years ago. Somebody says it's going to be a Quentin Tarantino rehab. There's not going to be a fucking rehab. You're not going to be in a fucking rehab. Okay? I'm shutting your butt down. <laughs> that was pretty good. Yeah. I know. I'll do a good Quentin. Yeah. That's a free Quentin, everybody. So everybody hit uh, <laughs> like and share and send us your super chats. There we go. Here come the nerds slowly. Everybody's partying tonight. So there's... They're uh, stumbling through their buzz to get to the YouTube they are, to watch the show. So. They watched Tristan, and now it's time. Nobody watches Tristan. Oh. So. <laughs> Just joking. We love you, little aids. We love you. Yeah, they're probably little aids. watching the end of Tristan, and then they'll come here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Tristan what? is still d doing his two-hour Elmo impersonation, <laughs> right? Oh, beep, beep, boo, boo. Uh, oh, I'm Tristan. <laughs> Got to do that. Elmo, David Attenborough, David Attenborough, I'm Tristan, and I do David Attenborough, and I do Elmo, do, and do Elmo Attenborough. Um, vegan gains, um, no, Tristan, not vegan gains, 
Um, so I know Jasmine is my wife, and Jasmine is on OnlyFans, and I do it. <laughs> so that's like, is there any more? <laughs> I think Tristan, Tristan has one more than he does. You know, if he gets on Elmo, it's gonna be like it's a twenty. You can minute skip Elmo, twenty minutes dude. of it, and then. <laughs> who's Tristan? <laughs> who's Tristan's other person? Do you remember? There's one. He's got four. Oh, he does oh, Bill Gates. Like Valley Girl. No, he, Gil, uh, Gil Bates and the Valley Girl. He does Valley Girl. He does the Valley Girl. Valley Girl. <laughs> and then. They're all really good, though. And then he but, does Gil Bates. Yeah. I call now. I got these numbers down. <laughs> that's, how, that's the Tristan style of Gil Bates. You got your numbers down. Mm-hmm. Anyway. All right, let's get back to the movies. They don't care about this. Okay. Oh, shush. Do the Oshos Booger Wishos. So, yeah. Tristan does do an Osho. By the way, we love Tristan. I'm still recovering. Tristan's okay. 20 minute Elmo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the year of Blade Runner. Shout out, Tristan. Made in 1982, and they thought we'd have all these things by 2019. We'd now, have replicants, now, we'd have fake animals, we'd have cars in the sky or whatever. Didn't they have that? Giant conglomeration billboards of Asian American yeah. fusion. Right? Yeah, I mean, Bill G- G- I mean, not, not Gil Bates, I'm thinking about Gil Bates. Uh, so this is PKD, right? Philip K. Dick. Uh, and it was neat to go back and watch Blade Runner because. We've done multiple analyses. It was one of the first big essays that I wrote that, of course, went into uh, Esther Hollywood, went into the book. And then uh, I did like a little mini documentary video. So if you've not watched that, go watch the Blade Runner documentary mini video. And I did a Blade Runner 2049 analysis as well. So you can go watch those. That comes up But later. it'll be fun to review this and uh, re-watching it. Uh, you always see something new. Blade Runner is one of those movies where every time you watch it, you will see something new. What's up, Steven? What's up, son of Tiamat? What's up to all the mods? Dangerfield, Jethro, uh, Tamara, TL. What's up? How y'all doing? Everybody give us a shout out, a like, and a share. Everybody loves the dystopian movies. Come on now. No, yeah, PKD is way better than Asimov. Asimov is cringe. Uh, Arthur C. Clarke, cringe. Asimov's all right. I mean, uh, uh, PKD's all right. Uh, so you got the Tyrell Corporation. Their logo is an owl. They create replicants who are mind control slaves. Yeah, so the owl, of course, is a, an Illuminous symbol. It's Minerva. It's the Bohemian Grove symbol. Everyone knows this, I think, by now. It's the goddess. I mean, it was chosen yeah. by Vyshopt and the Illuminati, so yeah. the, the actual historical ones, because they were the one who sees. Owls are also uh, emblems of spies, because uh, owls see at night, and they watch, and they surveil. And so these their are heads classic. swivel around, right? No, that's a myth. No, they do. No, that's a total myth. They're good boys. <laughs> um, but the real secret is the ones who don't... Owls' heads can only go up like that. They can't go <laughs> The ones who don't know their replicants. Who doesn't know their replicants? Oh, that's right. That is the secret of this whole movie. Yeah, and I think everybody knows that by yeah. now. Although some people, some nerds still debate, oh, no, excuse me, he's not actually a replicant. That is a false theory. Yeah, no, he's a replicant. Rip, Ridley Scott says it in interviews. Come on. His eyes shine. Duh, yeah. Well, who else could they get to hunt replicants than the rep exactly right. and nerds deb- love to debate any of these stupid yeah. fan theories fan fiction by the way you know mary sean young i do and yeah, she did a great friends. job and um yeah she's a good friend i still keep telling you to get me uh autographed Blade Runner posters from I Mary Sean Young that I can't get. <laughs> I can't get an autograph. I want an Someday. autograph, Mary. Maybe we get her to come on here on a live stream. Yeah, that'll be fun. Um, there was a off-world slave labor rebellion, the Nexus Rebellion. So this is the first axiom of creating robot people: is that they will uprise against you, right? And that's why Asimov had to create his three rules or whatever in iRobot. Oh, I forgot about iRobot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good um, point. So. 
Yeah, and remember, this is also going to have a um, Luciferian uh, Gnostic theme to it. Yeah. So the the bots here want to rebel against the Creator, and Tyrell is got a God the Father figure, right? He's the blind Gnostic, uh, bumbling Creator God who can't see anything and he doesn't know what he's made, and it's messed up. It's faulty. It dies after four years or whatever. And so Roy no, Batty is... It's mad for not making it eternal. Roy Batty's mad. And so Roy Batty is on a um, revenge quest along with his uh, assassin um, crew of uh, ex... Well, they were actually, I think, trained killers, These his crew. Mm-hmm. So he lives in the ziggurat, right? The right. Space so ziggurat. Tyrell lives in a giant pyramid. So in the future of L.A., which is a big cesspool hellhole... Uh, fairly accurate, I think. Mm-hmm. What year is this? Twenty nineteen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're pretty close there. <laughs> we don't have giant ziggurats from which uh, Governor Newsom rains down on everybody, but but it might as well be right. We're almost there. They have trigger words: turtle and mother. Right. So when they give the Voight comp test to uh, what's his face, it makes him snap. Uh, I don't know for sure that that's an intentional trigger word, but. The Voight comp test is supposed to see if the replicants can pass the test, right? To mm-hmm. see if they can fool everybody into thinking that they're human and even fooling themselves to believe they're human. That's, the, of course, the big story with Rachel and with Deckard. Mm-hmm. And then you have them advertising off-world colonies. Um, if you need to escape Earth, they've got these other mm-hmm. places you can go. And it's always like Shell Beach, like it's better than here. Go colonize. Yeah, Shell Beach is this recurring thing too, right? From yeah. it's actually in quite a few movies. Uh, What's the one where in, they float around dark, changing people? Dark City. Dark City. Yeah. And I want to say there's a, a, a type of a Shell Beach in Truman Show too, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's just that unobtainable place, paradise that they yes. try and sell it to you. Um, let's see. You know what a turtle is, Leon? What's a turtle? <laughs> Tortoise, turtle. So there's this test. There's dual soldier pleasure models. Right. So Pris is a pleasure model. Yeah. Roy Batty and his so, other guys are assassins. That's the second uh, rule of robots: is there must be sex bots. So there's always going to be soldier bots and sex bots. Well, you pointed out that Anton Lavey said a long time ago that there would be sex bots. Yeah. That, he predicted that, what, back in the 60s? Yeah. yeah that was his crazy. big idea. Like, he thought he was going to make as much money as Ford Motors with this sex bot idea. But... Well, he didn't live long enough to do it, but it probably will. I yeah. mean, all the uh, weirdo nerds out there, right? We're going to get a book that talks about that. Do you remember in uh, Firefly? Mm-hmm. Do you remember that the, the computer programmer nerd guy, Firefly, had sex bots too? Remember that? Mm. And then the other girl was like a geisha too. Right. There's She's a sex operative. And then there's the main girl is a programmed MK Ultra assassin. Oh, yes. The little. The chick, yeah. The, the little one. I forget her name. Me too. Okay. Um, More than human is the motto. More human than human. And they Rob Zombie. Shout out Rob Zombie. They implant memories to make the replicants think that they are human. And while how uh, ahead of the times was this, given the fact that DARPA now appear, claims to be able to implant memories. So they, mm-hmm. not just through microchips and all that kind of stuff, but also DARPA uh, claims to be able to sort of sever areas of the, the mind associated with certain, uh, you know, memories. Mm-hmm. Uh, or motor functions, right? I mean, I guess I've known how to do that since lobotomies. But now they claim at least to be able to kind of implant memories. A lot of troops have undergone this kind of experimentation, and we've covered that for, for many, many years. If you guys haven't heard the the uh, a summation analysis that we did of Annie Jacobson's 500-page History of DARPA book, I read that whole book, and then bid, we did a big uh, analysis. So go listen to that in the uh, Global Elites book series. Mm-hmm. We, get, we get into some of this, you know, like... Terminator stuff here. And Los Angeles is all Asian fusion now. Just like in Firefly. They all speak Chinese. Right. Yeah. 
Which is interesting because... They all swear in Chinese. Yes. So, to what degree did the, you know, the, the people like Ridley Scott, PKD, they were kind of the leftists of the time. And so it's odd that these leftists of that time are predicting, oh, in the dystopia, you're going to have the big uh, sort of melting pot. But mm-hmm. these are the very people nowadays, these so-called, you know, these leftists are the ones who, who promote the very thing that they were critiquing 20 or 30 years ago, mm-hmm. which is just an interesting turn of events, isn't it? Yeah. So the replicants are in search of their maker because he wants a longer life. This is just like Prometheus. Yeah. Right? Roy Batty is a Promethean character. Yeah. He will even, uh, you know, cite the William Blake poem, which is the most fascinating element of the movie in, in an esoteric sense, because William <coughs> Blake is, was a Gnostic, and the whole thing is about rebelling against the Creator God, and there's all these weird. It's like a, it's a poem about America, hmm. uh, and the orcs versus the king, and this kind of stuff, and it's. Fiery the orcs fell and this kind of stuff. It's really weird, but it's clearly a Gnostic reference to both America as a revolutionary nation and the revolutionaries as ultimately fighting against the creator God represented by the Tyrell figure. Mm -hmm. Um, What they did get right in this was they put TVs in cars. You remember that? And they had digital billboards. So the future does kind of look like that a little bit. There's uh, patterns of symbols in this movie that I went into great depth in my book about that is, I think, kind of stages of uh, illumination, you could say. There's an alchemical journey that goes on here with Deckard, where Deckard comes to self-realization. It's actually um, uh, the J- Edward James Olmos character who's leaving the symbols along the way, because we basically get the impression that Edward James almost knows the whole time that Deckard is a replicant. Oh, because he's leaving those little Because he's leaving those little things. And so he's a kind of a, mer- uh, a Mercury messenger figure. He even carries a staff like Mercury. He's, he's pictured like Mercury. So there's a lot of these alchemical and esoteric elements in Blade Runner that I went really, really deep into in my, my uh, essays. It's, uh, it's always dark. That's because this is neo noir, and so the whole style is is dark, you know, mm-hmm. smoky. But did something happen to the atmosphere in this? Well, in Blade Runner twenty forty nine, yes, the uh, the whole it's just clouds all the time because of I don't know smog and yeah, they've messed everything up. Or Bill Gates turned the sun. Gil off. Bates, yeah, Gil, Gil Bates turned off the sun. Why would you turn the sun off so we can have a Blade Runner dystopia? <laughs> Matrix was like that too. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, and so, speaking of Gnosticism, you've got the weirdo toy maker who is like a blind demiurge kind of. No. I mean, he an archon maybe? Or... Yeah, so there's Tyrell and he, his many other powers that make the different things, right? Mm-hmm. So there's the Asian man who um, builds the eyes. Hey, what do you do here? <laughs> yeah, I just make an eye, right? And then there's the... <laughs> Yeah. The redneck dude, the, the southern guy, well, I just make the toys. I make, I'm, hey, I made your legs. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets seduced by Pris. Right? Yeah, yeah. And then there's the overall archon figure of Tyrell who designs the whole thing and the, the, genet- the pseudogenetics and the, the synthetic DNA, right? Mm-hmm. So they have different parts. Different people do different functions. And so it's a kind of a Gnostic well, doctrine of creation, a polytheistic doctrine of creation. And you have the people that make the synthetic animals, like the snake lady, the dancing snake lady. Well, the Tyrell Corporation makes all of those. Yeah. But the one, one interesting element in the future is that real things have a high value. Uh-huh. So if you have a real snake, you, there's, they even make the joke that, well, nobody can afford a real snake. you got to be like a zillionaire. Mm-hmm. So everything that you own, uh, people that they have, is synthetic stuff. Right. The cops wear face shields, and they look scary in this dystopia. Well, speaking of dystopian things. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, The toy maker has Methuselah syndrome. Oh, I forgot about that. Remember that? The the southern guy. Well, I I look older than I am. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Grand old Opry. 
Hee haw. He oh he's <laughs> the hee haw toy maker. Okay, so this was gross when the guy met his maker. He squeezed his eyes out. Roy Batty. Yes. Right. Yeah, because he says I can't fix you, and <clears throat> Tyrell is blind almost. Mm. Mm-hmm. So he kills him by you know poking out his eyes, and that's all the more relevant given that the Tyrell logo is the owl. Right. Oh, right. So then what? So he's the blind creator. Yes. Which is the Gnostic Yaldabaoth. There's also a, quite a few, you know, esoteric and occultic images throughout. There's the unicorn. Uh, and the unicorn dream has to do with, uh, I think, him coming to realization of his implant, his own implanted memories. Yeah. You said the unicorn is his desire to be free. Yeah, and it, it's also something Ridley Scott puts in other films too because the unicorn plays a central role in legend, uh-huh. uh, which is actually an esoteric Gnostic movie. If you listen to the end, the song at the end of legend, really bizarrely, if you listen to the lyrics, uh, it literally starts mentioning like the Luciferian Gnostic du- duality. It's crazy. How does it go? Can you see it? There's two different versions. There's like a theatrical release pop version, and then there's a redone orchestral version. I don't remember how it goes. Oh, I want to hear this now. Well, we can go listen to the, uh, the the theme song of Legend, and you'll see that it's literally a Gnostic, dualist, esoteric allegory. And so, hence, the Mia Sarah character. Uh, there's a lot of sexual stuff going on with her and Jack at the beginning, the Tom Cruise character. And she loses the ring and I did a whole essay on this one as well. So. Uh, you got that nail in the hand symbolism. Do you remember that? Oh, Roy Batty is a Christ figure, right? Yeah. So he's like, uh, you know, the, one of the twists everybody knows is of course that you think Roy Batty is going to kill Deckard, but Roy, De- Roy Batty realizes that Deckard is one of his own. And so he saves him he awakens him. He awakens him. Yeah. There's a process of uh, illumination. Roy mm-hmm. Batty is that sacrificial illumination figure. And so he is a kind of a Lucifer figure here. But he's a Christ image figure in the sense that you see him with the pierced, you know, hand, the blood, and you see the dove. He ha- he holds a dove and he sets it free. Yeah, white doves crying. Because, in yeah, right. <laughs> so he goes full prince, right? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the doves cry, and Roy yeah. Batty sacrifices himself in his 19... He's got some funny-looking biker... He's like bearing, wearing biker shorts the whole time, which yeah. is funny. But, uh, Unicorn escape. He dies to save yeah. Deckard. So he, he saves yes. Deckard's life, right? And yeah. uh, I think that's one of the reasons why everybody finds this such a powerful film. Even though it's Gnostic, it, d- it still has that kind of you know self-sacrificial... Uh, Christ figure archetype going on in it. What do you think? Yeah. It's a now, well, well made, um, deep, mm-hmm. thought provoking. Well, I wanted to ask you because you you had not seen it in many, many years and you weren't sure that you'd ever watch the whole thing. Yeah. So what do you think about it now that you've seen the full uh, sort of in-depth analysis that, that you have? Um. Yeah, I liked it. Like you said, it was neo-noir, so it had that old-timey, classic Hollywood feel, but sci-fi, so that's a cool blend, I think. Um, by the way, you can support us uh, by donating to the Tom uh, Coom <laughs> uh, fund. Um, we're not going to say what we're going to do with that money, but basically it goes into a hedge fund of crypto that then Tom Coom can draw from for a new yacht. So basically, we everybody want if you want to uh, help Tom Coom get a new yacht, please donate and help with, via the super chats. And um, yeah, that's it. Nice. Okay, that was Blade Runner. And uh, if you do donate to the Tom Coom Fund, you will get a cocktail. <laughs> uh, you will be participating in all of the right moves. Uh, it will be uh, days of thunder basically year round and uh, you will have a eyes wide shut party you'll be the top gun you'll be the top gun amongst all your friends and family you will avoid oblivion and 
I'm running out of Tom Coon movies. It'll taste like a vanilla sky nice. if you were to eat it. Um, what are the tongue? Uh, you won't be far and away. No, you won't, you'll be very close to us and it will be like you completed an impossible mission. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> the Coon poems. The what? That was like a, a Tom Coon poem. Oh. Beautiful. It was a high coon. <laughs> that was really good. Do you remember the uh, tasteful and art artfully done love scene between him and Penelope Cruz and Vanilla Sky? That was extra that was the cringe. Worst scene. Of that was all time. so bad, dude. Cringe with more cringe. I hate that. <laughs> At least she didn't anyway. shave him. <laughs> that would only make it worse. There <laughs> <laughs> right, go. Where are we at? Okay. Um, the island. Oh, that the island. Now, I did do an island video, but. The reason that we're redoing some of these is for your own viewing pleasure. You guys not... find so much pleasure in our, even redoing the classics. Um, even though I did a island video, it was once again fun to rewatch the island. Now, the island is funny as a side note because the makers of the Mystery Science Theater spoofed uh, film Parts the Clonus Horror uh, had to, I think, settle out of court with some kind of uh, dispute that they had with Michael Bay and company over the island because there's a B movie from the 70s and the Mystery Science Theater is pretty funny I recommend watching it if you've never seen it parts the Clonus horror it is really similar <laughs> to the island so really? yeah so um, I don't know but you know Michael Bay he likes to make things blow up and he likes uh, lens flares a lot a lot, lot, lot of lens flares. Um, the lens flares have lens flares. The explosions themselves blow up into more explosions. This is Michael Bay. And yeah. even though the island is absurd and pretty goofy, and it's basically all the dystopias into one, there's something about this movie that's actually enjoyable. I actually like, I mean, I know it's crazy. And it's dumb, but I like the island. It's, it's not a bad movie. It's not. It's all the dystopia. It's Brave New it, World and yeah. like every dystopia. Logan's yeah. Run. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It grips you and it doesn't lag in anything. It's constantly changing. You think you might be in this weird base forever, but it, when they bust we out. Should do, we should do Final Sacrifice, by the, by the way. I know you guys in the chat. I'm sorry. I know you guys in the chat are talking about. Rouse Tower! <laughs> Rouse Tower! Oh, yeah. yeah. All right, kids, shut up. Right. The Final Sacrifice, definitely a classic. They made I a, love the Final a video Sacrifice. game about that, remember? Yeah, somebody made, <laughs> somebody made a Rouse Tower video game. It was pretty awesome. Like he, and he like he, he refuels with uh, like six packs of obscure Canadian beers. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, yeah. Rouse Tower! Oh, yeah, you got the uh, old prospector, right? Uh, Mike Pipper. Mike Pipper. <laughs> Mike Pipper, I think, is the dad of the skinny kid. But the prospector is uh, uh, an awesome character. Browsed out. What? What's the kid's name? Do you remember? I don't... His dad, it's either Mike Pipper or the dad's Mike Pipper. Oh, okay. Oh, Mike Pipper, you see? Well, the slogan for this movie is... You're special, you're chosen, the island awaits you. Now, remember, the island uh, is about clones, and it's about uh, eugenics. It even comes up later on. Uh, they mention the eugenics laws that are passed. And so since there's laws against experimenting on humans, which is weird because the Senate Congress just passed a few months ago laws relating to cloning and uh, cross-species engineering, that this is uh, cool now. It's cool now. Mm-hmm. We're, we're going into the island. I guess the island is going to be where we are. And the island is about cloning for the purpose of organ trafficking and harvesting. Well, so the really, really rich dudes get a clone and then they just harvest whatever organ they need. Two things. Uh, the island is not real. 
just like Shell Beach. So there's another um, correlation to that other world. Right. Yeah. Like Logan's Run, they live in an enclosed uh, society based around a lie, and and, and, and that's that's an often that's a recurring theme. They're being advertised the dream of freedom. Right. So they control your dreams and your hopes and your freedom yes. and your 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 ticket to Valhalla mm-hmm. to the Paradise Island or whatever. And they control your so-called escape, just yes. like Snowpiercer. And Logan just Hall. like in Logan's Run, you just get in, you get killed. Mm-hmm. So, haha, we tricked you. <laughs> um, you don't get to go. You just get sliced up, dude. Right? So, yeah. So this takes place in the same year as Blade Runner. So, 2019? Yeah. And made in 2005. He, I wasn't saw in the theater. I remember that. He wakes up in a smart room and everything monitors his bodily functions and his sleep and his pee. And this is where we're going, by the way, yeah. where we're going to have smart houses that are, that are going to analyze our PPE to tell us he can't have how much, you know, bacon we had that day. This is so, this is so preposterous. Right. So and it's amazing. They're selling everybody on the he's technocracy. Got a Fitbit. Yeah. That he has to wear. But they're selling everybody on technocracy out of ease and simplicity. And everybody's going into their own enslavement. Yes. And they put the Apple Watch on themselves. And That's a Schwitzgabel machine. What's that? It's a machine that comes out of the prison system. I've covered it for like seven years. Which is where they track prisoners and all of their heartbeat. And that's what the Fitbit and the Apple Watch is. Oh, is a okay. fish cable machine. Okay. That's so creepy. Gross. It's... People don't understand that the technology literally comes out of the prison system. Mm. Mm-hmm. Literally. Um, everyone is the same. They all have the same clothes, the same routines, the same jobs. Right. That's because they're kept in a childlike state. So yeah. it's a perfect society of people kept in a, in perfect health, whatnot. And they're and all... I, I kept wondering why they're acting so dumb. But... You, that's part of it. You don't learn till later that they have the mentality of a 15-year-old, they said. Right, because they don't want them to figure out what's really going on. Right. And likewise, with all of you, Arrested Development, not you guys in this audience, because you guys in this audience all have 1,000 IQs, but for the average NPC norm, per, normie person, the Arrested Development low IQ state is so that you don't figure out how the world works. Thus, this channel helping you figure out how the world works. And please, if you would, support us via the Super Chats. That's how we keep going. You can also support us via the Streamlabs, or not just Streamlabs, but buying the books. And our sponsor, Chalk.com, right? If you want to maintain that mojo, order the She Legit Mushrooms that Chalk.com offers in the link in the show description and use the promo code J-A-Y and you get a discount. So support us there. Also, the second half of the show, if you're watching it, will be available in the next few days to the subscribers at jaysanalysis.com. It's over 9,000. For your health. (laughs) So there's this lottery that chooses who leaves the compound to go to the island, which they call nature's last remaining pathogen-free zone. So there's keeping the people oh man (laughs) all i did was pick it up and it like shot out (laughs) they're keeping the people tom (laughs) koof tom koof attacked me with koofy coffee koof (laughs) tom (laughs) koofy there's a little tom coon demon that like (laughs) flung a bunch of coffee on me he's going (laughs) a tiny little tom coon it'll dry out anyway go ahead he got you um, for health. Yeah, for so health. They they tell the people they can't go outside because there's pathogens outside. Whoa, where have we heard that? Yeah, so you have to stay in this. You've got coof at all. There's the coof at all in your shirt. Right. Literally, I heard a woman talking about the, the the medical professionals were telling her that the coat she wore was covered in coofed. Dude, and by the way, Michael Bay. Made Songbird. We forgot to mention Songbird. I watched Songbird, which was crazy, dude. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Songbird. That one about the... Kufid uh, 25. Yeah. Not Kufid 19. Kufid 25. Yeah. 
the later variants. With the pokies. The variants. And she couldn't do prom with the boy until she got the pokey. Right. Was and Matt dad bod in that? No. Or who was the dad bod in that? Of the daughter? Just, no, don't worry about it. Look. Okay. It's Michael Bay. Yes. And he, at the beginning of the movie, there's Kufid floating around everywhere on everything. <laughs> <laughs> this is little so spores. dumb, dude. Oh, yeah. I remember them yeah. floating through the air. The little coof spores. They were cute. But see, people believe that. They think that yes. that's what's... That's why they... How it all works. They keep their this windows so dumb, shut dude. because it's all floating in the air at all times. <laughs> and So Demi Moore is in it. And you have to get your food through a little hole in your front door. Yeah, yeah. You can't go outside. And literally everybody's wearing hazmat suits. But you remember Contagion? <laughs> Excuse me, I'm drinking kombucha. <laughs> yeah, I did an analysis of the movie. Yeah, so Contagion. I remember what you said. Okay, and Songbird are similar. Yes, I did a whole video on, okay. on uh, Contagion for sure. Right. Go ahead. Um, where was I? He has to eat the slop because the computer said so. So he. This was all nice. This is too borrowed salty. from 1984. Yeah. Yeah, and the computer is like, "You eat oat milk." Right. Um, they have to social distance because of the rules of proximity. Mm-hmm. Remember that they can't get close to each other. But that's because they don't want them engaging in like sexual activity because the the bodies have to be preserved as you know pristine as possible for mm-hmm. the wealthy people who own these clones. Mm-hmm. That's so weird. Uh, let's see. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, I'm convinced of cloning. I, I'm, a, I'm a cloning skeptic. I mean, I don't know how real or possibly real this is. I mean, again, I'm just a science skeptic. I'm not saying that I know anything about it. But, again, I always go back to the ear on the mouse. It's not an ear on a mouse. Oh, and yeah. they claimed... There's all there's a lot of science for all that's I feel like science I don't know anything about science like it's how do you know anything about science when it there's so much scientific fraud yeah a lot of the scientists are just con men with grants that just and they fudge the research and the data Joe Rogan's done even tons of shows on this so pretty much everybody knows this now so it's kind of amazing that um, all of the normies are like trust the science. I trust the science. While they're on an oxygen machine. I trust the science. I got bonus, but I trust the science. Right. But isn't that the point of science is you don't have to have faith in it because it just is or supposedly is supposed to be like a observable thing, a truth that you don't okay, have to believe in. That's what normies think is smart. Okay. Uh-huh. So facts have to be interpreted. There's no such thing as brute facts. You don't just look at an earthworm and know everything about it. <laughs> you have to interpret things. Mm-hmm. And the the people in this domain think that this is still 1750 or, or 1845 where the world was under this delusion of enlightenment, positivism, and rationalism, which has been deconstructed. Nobody believes that anymore except in the domain of the normie, you know, scientism sphere. Mm-hmm. So people who believe scientism don't even know that scientism is a worldview that has fallen and collapsed at least 100, 150 years ago. Mm-hmm. But they don't know that, and they're too dumb to know that. That's actually and why... And they think all scientists are altruistic. Yeah, it's so dumb. And that's why Neil deGrasse Tyson says, don't study philosophy. Literally. Mm. Famously, he said that three or four years. I wrote a whole essay against that, just how stupid that was. So the island also is about the ethics of this mad scientist, Sean Bean, who thinks he can cure all the diseases and elongate life, just like in Blade Runner. So elongate he... life? <laughs> yeah. I like your new words. <laughs> yep. All right. Somebody said that serial killers make up neologism, so are you a serial killer? <laughs> yep. Elongate. Um... Elongate their lifespan with extendo bite. Extendo bite? Mm-hmm. I extendo saw a picture of a I saw a picture of a, I saw a picture of a boomer. I saw a picture of a boomer with a face shield and a mask smoking a cigarette. Yeah. I saw <laughs> a video <laughs> of two boomers with masks that had um open like opened with your mouth so they could eat. Have you seen the symphony but with they the look hole like in the mask? Muppets. Yeah. They look like Muppets eating and 
it was just where are we Sad, at? Really. Let's get through this. Okay. He puts nanobots in his eyes to scan his brain. Okay. Oh, I forgot about the nanotech. Yeah. So, Sean Bean's a mad hatter scientist who... Fagando! Yeah. Sean Bean! Fagando! And he's... We should use the... <laughs> Fagando! I can't do it right. The last time I did my Sean Bean, I did it good. He starts to notice that you and McGregor... It is a gift! <laughs> ...character... <laughs> is Sean Bean is always a bad guy. He's yeah, a bad he, guy. yeah. He's like always the smooth CEO bad guy. Well, ever since the Pierce Brosnan, where he's the the evil MI6 agent, mm-hmm. and he double crosses Pierce. Is that that's Golden Eye? I think mm. Golden Eye. Da dum dum dum. Anyway. Fogando! <laughs> uh, Come on now, that's a pretty good... Can you do... That's a pretty good Sean Bean. Can you do Steve Buscemi? Mm-mm. He's a wily machinist in this. I forgot, about, I forgot Steve Buscemi's in this. Yeah, yeah. And, well, he's a he's the drunk guy who eventually helps him get out. Yeah. And they realize that they see a butterfly, right? Yeah, because they're so naive and childlike and obedient, Steve Buscemi kind of feels bad and gives them a little alcohol mm-hmm, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Shout out to, uh, we got 213 nerds in the house tonight. Nothing better to do on a Friday night. They're just talking about Lotter, Lord of the Rings, baby. How come the Eagles didn't just drop it in? That's what I you're just repeating memes that you saw. I said that before there was ever a meme about that. They could fly the whole time. It is a gift. <laughs> because it's not about the... It's about the journey of his struggle, right? Where there's a whip, there's a way. Why is chip, taters, old? Chip the dishes, crack <laughs> the plates. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. What's taters, precious? That's pretty good. That's pretty good for you. We're taking the hobbits to Isengard! Potatoes! <laughs> People love this. They love the Sam. Sam! Where's your photo? Where's your photo? Here come, here come the hobbits. Where's your photo? Here come the elves! Sam. The Lembus bread. Anyway, go ahead. He popped up in one of these. Oh, the one we're going to talk about, Back to the Future too. Little Elijah Wood. Oh yeah, there's like there's a brief cameo yeah, of yeah. of uh, Frodo in Back to the Future too, yeah. which we were surprised to see. So let's see, people are grown in sacks and birthed in a lab fully adult size. They're a product. So all the people that live with Ewan McGregor and Scarlett Johansson eating the slop and having their urine tested, they're just grown in a big giant. Okay, yeah, we know thing. that. Let's move on down. Um, let's see. Lottery Island looks like a crappy sandals commercial. It does. Uh, very 2005 CGI <laughs> island. Michael Clark Duncan makes a run for it. You remember that part? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's how he finds out. And then Ving Roms is in it, right? Or not Ving Roms. No. It? Digimon Honsu? No. Who's what? the black dude that gets killed? Ving. He's one of the ones that thinks... Michael he... Clark Duncan. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. I, yeah. got, I get my... Uh, There's Ving Rhames, Michael Clark, and okay. Well, I get all, I get those guys mixed two, up. I know who Jamon Hansu. Okay, is. he's also in this as the bounty hunter. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, that was interesting when he is going through the. Seat. I will be playing, by the way, Jamon Jamon Hansu in the live story of Jamon Hansu. I'll be playing him. Oh, do you remember the security issues a contamination alert on them when they try to escape? So they're still playing that. It's contaminated. Yeah. It's contaminated. <laughs> and that's how they explain how they're all stupid when they're born. And they're still adults. They're like, yeah. They're still going through decam... Decam... How do you say that? I'm too old for this shit. <laughs> Decontamination. Somebody said Danny Glover, so I had to do it. Yeah. I'm good too old for this shit. There's a room where they're programmed like Clockwork Orange. You remember that? Where they're just laying and the TV's flickering in their face. To yeah, and that's funny because I, I just read, which I'm almost done with, the part two of Rosemary's Baby and human trafficking thing that I 
am so late on. Uh, I just read a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and now I would never can remember which one's which, but a famous paper that he delivered about ritual abuse, and he has a whole section about people in cults. He doesn't mention exactly what cult, but he says, yes, I've treated people in various cults who were put under these machines, these, these clockwork orange machines. These, these are real mm. for the purpose of mind control. Uh, the whole thing is in like a matrix underground that only looks like the ocean, but it's actually in the desert. Right. It's an underground base. Yeah. Dumbs, dude. And then I like how they just happen to try to escape on Sean Bean's big presentation day. So he's trying to sell this to everyone because they tell you it's just a lump of meat, but it's actually a whole person. Well, Sean Bean was trying to sell everybody at the fellowship on using the ring. It, it is a gift. It's like what Alex was talking about today. What thing? Um, the... The what? Because they try and tell the the public that we're growing a thing in the lab. Oh, that's just right. a hunk of meat. And if the public actually knew that they're full sentient beings, then maybe they would stop oh. making clones. Yes. So this is like a um, humans are resources. Humans yeah. aren't made in the image of God. They're products. Humans are, and, and this is the whole Darwinian myth is there to convince everybody that. Humans are just another animal. Yeah. Which is just absurd. That Don't you understand? Well, not just... That you lose your own dignity when you believe that? Mm -hmm. But not just another animal, like lower than that, just like a hunk of it's, you're vegetable a, meat. You're a resource. Yes. That's what human resource means. Yes. Because um, they figured out the clone bodies... You are just spam. <laughs> you are spam. You're smeat. Smeat. Which... That was in a dystopian movie. Which one? Millennia. Millennium. Yeah, he found the smeat. Oh, Frank Black. Yeah. Okay, that wasn't dystopia. But that was about the Illuminati. Yeah. Yeah, there's some company that makes smeat. <laughs> yeah, can smeat. Which is a pretty awesome movie version of Spam because <laughs> they couldn't use Spam, so they, <laughs> they called it smeat. <laughs> After a full meal so, of after a full meal of meat, I like to sit back and experience a nice smooth <laughs> uh, Morley. Right? Yes. They they tried to make meat in the beginning, but it kept dying. So they figured out they had to make a whole person, or the organs would fail. Did you guys notice in Millennium that somebody finds a burning uh, Morley on the ground? Mm. Frank Black. So that means the cigarette man was in. But Morley's are in more movies. I know that, but oh, okay. that I think it's supposed to be the X Files. It is the X Files universe because yeah. Frank Black is comes. It's a spinoff from the episode where they, where he helps Mulder and Scully. Yes. Millennium. Three people said Soylent Green. Yeah, we're gonna do that in the part two of this. If you guys have not watched all three seasons of Millennium, it's great. I finally we we did I did a uh, wrote an essay on it. We didn't do a show on it, but uh, Millennium's great, and they actually put. Well, I'll put it this way: it ends up being the creation of serial killers and very high IQ people. So the, the establishment can create ser serial killers. That's the uh, now. There's a lot more to it than that, but. It's it's a great show. And one thing that Millennium does that's weird is that season one and two go in a certain direction. And then season three goes in a different direction. It's like a different type of show. So if you're into conspiracy shows, if you like that kind of artistic, that genre, and you like the X-Files, definitely watch Millennium and stay with it because it will go in a different direction in season three. Mm -hmm. Millennium is a spinoff show from X-Files. It's a three season show with Lance Henriksen as the FBI consultant. We have to watch... Named Frank Black. Uh, Frank Black. Remember I, was do remember I was doing my impressions of Frank Black? Yeah. The killer sees his mom and everything that he does. <laughs> he wants vengeance on his mother. He believes he must kill all prostitutes which represent his mom. All right, that's literally yeah. like every episode. The, the killer has a psychosis. Yeah. The killer believes he's getting vengeance on his mother. Yeah. The killer is executing his own justice. Yeah. There was actually a, an episode where a judge was a killer. That was pretty awesome. Mm-hmm. 
And the judge was crazy, and he was ex- he was like executing judgment on everybody. Do you remember the killer who liked bombing things that turned him on? Yes. That was weird. It was, and yeah, it okay. was yeah, dirty. Right. Back to the island, which they are totally innocent because all of their media is controlled, and they they're reading things like Dick and Jane, and they're. Did you remember that? Because they have to grow up. All what is Dick and Jane a comic book? Or something? I don't even know. No, what it's that just is. like a a little Doctor Seuss book, like Seed Spot Run type of oh baby book. Okay. So this is the kind of media that they're given. Yeah. Um, well, they're in a surveillance society too, because when they get out and they try to do a credit card, yes, they find them right away. Right. Um. So they have to find the people who bought them. They think if they find their sponsors and if they get the word out that they're actually human beings, that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, things will change, which that never happens, mm. right? Yeah. So he has to do it himself. He has to go take down Sean Bean and right. the entire enterprise. And this is where the Michael Bay of it really comes out in its fullest when he's like yeah. destroying this facility, right? I think the Pentagon should hire Michael Bay for war. Because Michael Bay just wants to blow stuff up. So if he if you get Michael Bay to figure out you could Michael Bay could just blow stuff up and then you could show people that and then it would be like the ultimate FFO fake flag operation. Yeah, exactly. He, and people would be like, dude, this is the We don't mess with America because look the, at what the they next do. War but it's just a Michael Bay. <laughs> The next war will be directed by Michael Bay. That's <laughs> exactly. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> World War Three, produced executive producer Michael Bay. Yeah. All right, are we done? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, they have a big scene about bioethics and all that stupid That's stuff. That's the key point, and that mentions and he, the eugenics laws. Yeah, and he has to blow up about how he's the genius who's right. going to solve all mankind's problems with right science. And his science. Look at that! Look at that! Tom Coom on screen, baby. Nice. I'm going to keep doing it. Um, oh, Ewan McGregor. This was interesting. The guy that made his clone, his sponsor, they call him, the rich guy who bought him. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is about to die from liver failure because of a sex disease. Yeah. So, I'll <laughs> so this poor he's got, Coomer is making a he's clone got, for himself. He's got Tom Coom syndrome. Yes. And he needs the body parts of a fresh and healthy Ewan McGregor. Island, what do you give it? What do you think? Sorry. It is what it is. It is what it is. It gets five explosions. It, it, you'll like it. Let's see. Snowpiercer? Or, and say Robocop? No, let's do Robocop. I mean, let's move a little faster because we, okay. we got to get through these before we, uh, Halt. Take too much time. Citizen. Halt, citizen. I'm yes. here to protect you, Robocop, in 2028. Vanna White was the news anchor? Yeah. Literally? So I this, didn't know that. Paul Verhoeven likes this style where he does fake um, news clips and commercials and mm-hmm. fake TV. He puts in, like, and he like David Lynch was does. excessive on violence. Like Paul Verhoeven would have the most ridiculous <laughs> violence scenes. So if you watch Starship Troopers, if you watch uh, Total Recall, and if you watch RoboCop, it's just so over the top. It's crazy. Yeah. <clears throat> so RoboCop was made in 1987, and it takes place in 2028. So we've got seven more years before mm-hmm. uh, we're talking about nuclear neutron bombs in South Africa, and you have the apartheid war there. Mm-hmm. By the way, this movie is one of the most accurate as to what's going on and where we are. And I didn't. Re- I know people have said this for many, many years. I've watched RoboCop many times, but only this time around did we really pay attention and analyze it. And so everybody's right. This is uh, powerful uh, predictions in in RoboCop. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you have a commercial for the Artificial Organ Institute, the Family Heart Center. So there's more. Smeat making and right, humans science. are just smeat, and right. you can buy a new You're just heart. spam, dude. Yeah, um, and this one is really 
revelatory because mm -hmm. uh, Omnicorp buys the police force. So privatized and, police. And this is Detroit, so a crumbling city. Right. The, uh, the corporations whole, come in. Right, the big, you know, motor city has now collapsed. I don't know if Detroit had uh, like fall, fallen apart and collapsed by 1987. It probably did. I don't remember when. Uh, remember, uh, who's that goober? Um, uh, Michael Moore. Remember he made, didn't he make that documentary about, no, he made the one about Flint, Michigan. Yes. Never mind. But uh, I feel sure that right, the collapse of Detroit was by design and it was a bunch of you know shenanigans. I don't know the whole story of that, but what isn't corruption and shenanigans? I mean, come on, everything, right? Yeah. So. Like, oh, it's because they took all of the jobs overseas. Right. I know that. Right. Yeah. So that was also oh, NAFTA. So, uh, so prior to NAFTA, yeah. prior to all of that stuff. Yeah. Um. Then they talk about the Star Wars orbiting peace program and the supposed presidents up there, like so doing right. a so photo this is, shoot. In this space. is right around the time of SDI and Reagan. Yeah. So that's why that's in there. Um, although, I guess we're kind of at the point where SDI and all that's. I mean, in, if you look at it like the you know Neuralink and Skylink and the you know satellite internet systems that they're building, I guess that's accurate. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a crime boss at large. What's his name? Kurtwood Smith. Kurtwood Smith. He hates cops because cops hate him. Yes. He and, makes it very clear. And you have that goofy, I'd buy that for a dollar. Yeah. Remember? Everyone watches this uh, terrible show. Which, and they always, it's, it's, it's funny that everyone laughs just when this guy pops up because he's not funny at all. But everybody just dies laughing when they it's see like him. It's like lower tier than dad boomer humor. Yeah. It, it's just weird. Um, it's Murphy's first day, so he's going to have a great first day on the police force yeah, of Detroit, yeah. <laughs> right? Well, be keep in mind too, like awesome. this is predicting robot cops, which yeah. we are now seeing roll out. Yeah. And they rolled out robot cops in the midst of the coof. So they want to build a new city on top of the crumbling Detroit. They want to make it Delta City. So it's gentrification. Yes destroy the existing thing and rebuild they and can't build it until the crime is and privatize police this yeah. is key yeah so they're trying to eradicate all the riffraff um so they can start over and they want space exploration and this smart city but they also want to foster crime that's an amazing insight that this movie has right we'll get to that in a second because yeah. that's a whole scene right itself um so you have the the corporation, the evil Monsanto mega Omnicorp, Omnicorp, right? The, your Tyrell or whatever. The, all of these. Yeah. What's Every that? Every dystopian the Umbrella movie. Corp. Right. Right. Umbrella Tyrell. Yeah. Uh, Waylon Utani in Alien. Yes. And Omnicorp. They, they make this giant robot thingy that they're gonna have pull, patrol the streets. Yeah. Right. But it's like uh, what. An enforcement droid, this big thing, and it growls, and it's like, "Stop! I like drop he, your weapon!" I like when he squeals when he <laughs> falls over. <laughs> yes. But, I mean, a robot has to squeal, obviously. It growls, and it's like when they make uh, in horror movies, they make spiders squeal too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he malfunctions on his first trial in mm -hmm. front of the board, and he wastes the dude. Right. And so they have to find something better. So, I mean, when is, we're going to see DARPA roll this stuff out, right? Yes. So, I don't know if it's after the World War Three or what, but they're going to roll out the, the AI, you know. Bot. It'll probably look like that thing, the E, the the special Ed 3000 or whatever it's called. Or the DARPA dogs that chase yeah. you. So, you'll have Ed 209 and a DARPA dog after uh, your ass. A asked. mini at at. It is a mini at at, exactly. Yes. Um. Leland is a robber with Kurtwood Smith. Yes, Ray Wise pops up as uh, one of the enforcers of this gang, which is pretty funny. Yeah, and of course the gang, their hideout is an abandoned factory, like it has to be. When is there not stuff going down at a factory? Why don't police? If you just... live in a, if you're in movie world, if you're in any fictional movie world, just go to an abandoned factory. There's literally like twenty gangsters <laughs> doing shit there. Just go they there. They sublet. Like spaces and rent out partitions to different criminals. 
every abandoned factory is just a hub. <laughs> they should basically just get rid of abandoned factories and there would be no more crime in okay. movie world. That's what I've been saying. No, that's what I've been saying. Have you been listening to the bad guy hyena laughing in this movie? Is over the top. Yes. Every bad guy has the most ridiculous hyena laugh. Mm-hmm. So. Um, I like how Murphy survives like a hundred shotgun blasts. That's Paul Verhoeven. Yeah, and, and including one to the forehead. <laughs> um, Stop. <laughs> Special Ed 209. Well, when his life is flashing before his eyes, he remembers his son watching this um, mm-hmm. cool cop, mm-hmm. the TJ Laser, that he wants yes, to Yes, TJ Laser. He's TJ Laser. Yes, he's the real TJ Laser. What if it's all in his head? I'm just kidding. Uh-huh. A nutrient paste sustains his organic system. Yum, yum. So you've got that in three movies at least. <coughs> three dystopias is eating. Yes, stock. we've talked about police drones. We've talked about all that, guys. We've been saying that it's all here. I know. Yeah. Go ahead. Eat the paste in this movie. What? What's the paste? I don't remember. A nutrient paste sustains his organic system. Remember, oh, she has to feed him baby Robo-Cop food. Robocop has to eat baby food. He's Gerber. <laughs> yes. Yep. Which is kind of ridiculous. <clears throat> He serves I kind of wonder, I mean, I, watching this again, some of it was so, kind of absurd. I was like, is this a satire movie? I mean, because Starship Troopers is supposed to be satire. Yes, that's his, I think that's just his personality, though, is like sarcastic and... No, 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 Paul Verhoeven. Uh, that's what I mean. Okay. Yeah, Paul Verhoeven with the Starship Troopers and the weird stuff in that. Um, he's got three directives and then the, a private fourth directive so there's something going on <clears throat> they've programmed into him that he d- doesn't know about mm-hmm. right uh they have this commercial for a game like battleship but it's nukem like a family board game Battle, yeah, remember, remember that, that? Mm-hmm. um let's see Robocop cleaning up the city, getting triggered by things. He has a USB spike port. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> his fist. Which I think he doesn't need to take care of Kurt Wood Smith with that. Yeah. The end, yeah. So he goes to see his family, but they're all gone. And. And what was, the, I don't remember the explanation of that. What happened to his wife and kid? They thought he was dead because the police. Told them. So he's Robococ now, like yes. she's remarried. <laughs> yeah. Citizen, um, stop. <laughs> that is my wife. He goes clubbing, and that's where I find Leland. So remember, he Robocop walking through the. Did he go club? to the pink room? Because that's where to find Leland. Haha. <laughs> that was one of the funny things in the island. It's like in this self-contained place that they have to live and do all of their mm-hmm. work. At night, they turned the lights down and, and did club scenes, and they could order like drinks and stuff to make it feel like mm-hmm. normal. It's funny. Well, uh, somebody said, "Did he uh, is he waterproof?" Yes, because he fights Kurtwood Smith in Dude. a bunch of mud, muddy water, and that other guy gets uh, <laughs> covered in toxic waste. Oh <laughs> so yeah. He, so there's just a giant vat that's conveniently called toxic waste. That comes out of the he, truck? And he wrecks his truck into it. No, he wrecks into the vat. Oh. And Did you not see him. that scene? That was what I was I laughing about. I just remember the, the splash coming out of the back of a truck. Because he wrecked into a vat called toxic waste. Okay. Toxic waste doesn't just splash <laughs> out of trucks, Jamie. It doesn't just appear out of nowhere. It will, like spontaneous combustion. Or it will turn you into... Instantaneous creation. Joker. That's true. If you fall into toxic waste, your hair will turn purple or green. Okay, let's go. Let's get through this. Where are we at? He's on a mission to get Clarence Butt Liquor. Dick Jones hired Kurt with Smith to kill his rival. <laughs> Clarence Butt <Liquor. laughs> The crime boss works with a guy who owns the police. So there's one of the big... This is a big, characters. great... Yeah, so the, the corporate leader guy owns the cops and is working with the organized crime. That's so crucial. Yeah. And the corporate people run the organized crime. Yes. <clears throat> and the cops. And he tries to sweeten the deal with Kurt Wood Smith saying, when we're going to build this Delta City, we're going to have all these workers come. And, and you, you sell think- drugs to the workers. Yes. Uh, Amazing. Robocop's secret fourth record, he can't arrest a senior officer of the... Um, the corporation. Uh, 
He's a product with no free will. And then he has to fight ED209, who can't step down steps because his three toes don't work like that ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he falls over and squeals. Yes. Yeah! Robo tantrum. Um, but robots all squeal, sure. The cops turn on Robocop. Mm-hmm. And he still survives that whole assailant of bullets from the entire police force. Right. <clears throat> anyway, so... Yeah, I mean, that's essentially <laughs> Squirt Wood Smith. That was my joke, because he gets stabbed in the neck in the blood. Squirt oh, Wood yeah. Smith. <laughs> Squirt Wood Smith. S-U-X. Misfire Space. What? Lasers Burning California? Oh, there's was lasers the from, the, from SDI, Directed Energy Weapons, Burning yeah. California. That was on the news. Which some people have theorized could um, be a current. They make a joke about the Hooters girls have had their shots, so there's like these... Stabs? Mm-hmm. The girls on the TV show say, I've had my stabs! Yes. Wow. So that's Robocop. Mm-hmm. He gets them in the end. He kicks their scrawny human butts with his robo strength. Now, there's a part two, but I don't remember it being very good. Um, if you would, be sure to hit like and share and also support the show via Super Chats through Streamlabs. Streamlabs is the way to do Super Chats now. And we'll read those here in a moment, if you would. And now we come to um, a movie that I think is pretty good. Um, I wrote an essay on it back at the time, many years ago. It was an early Jay's analysis essay, just like uh, a lot of these others that you've seen, like Blade Runner. So, Snowpiercer. Bong Joon Ho. Bong Joon Ho. This is a scary one because I hate snow and ice and frozen tundras of nothing. So, in 2014, there was climate change. Well, what's interesting is that it mentions the uh, uh, the geoengineering to change weather Mm -hmm. and this leads to a messing up the entire uh you know biosphere and the cw7 that sprayed ends up freezing the world and we have a new ice age right so the c-h-e-m-t-r-a-i-l-s they show them that and the survivors live on a never-ending train that just goes through the snow so there's this perpetual motion machine that is the uh society it's right, but it's the train is an engine, and it's the perpetual motion machine that is now the new compacted civilization. So this is an allegory for many things, for society, for uh, structured society, for um, for God, because Wilford is a kind of Gnostic demiurge once again. Yes. So you have the military class and the poor class and the. There's a bunch Luxury of different classes class. right there. So there's like every every car on this train has a class or a uh, a kind of a, a, a gradation of where you can be. Right. So the poorest people are at the end, the caboose, the, the evil, butt, the, the booty caboose. of the, the evil caboose <clears throat> of the train. And then the Wilford is in the engine room, the, the very front, the most elite. So there's a, a revolution to get to the front of the train. The Curtis Revolution. Yes. And it's even led tra- by Captain America. Led by Chris Evans. Even trademarked Ed Harris at the end says, "Ah, the Curtis Revolution. Wasn't yes. that a great story that we planned?" Uh, now that's again, that's the twist at the end, right? And I'm sure these people know. But what's amazing about this is that this is a movie about controlled dialectics. It's a movie about revolutions being run and controlled by the elites, by the system, by those that run the system. Mm-hmm. They know how to manage and engineer revolutions. And that's ironic because John Hurt plays the co-conspirator with Ed Harris, Wilford, right? Mm -hmm. In arranging and staging and handling Curtis in this revolution. Right. So Now, the reason that's relevant is because John Hurt plays Winston, who gets duped into believing O'Brien's staged revolution. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. The theory and practice of oligarchical collectivism 
is the critique of Big Brother that O'Brien himself wrote. And it's a trick. Mm -hmm. So they think that the person who controls the engine controls the experience on the train. And they think there's a tyrant at the front, but they don't realize that there's... Well, there is. Yeah. Right. But they're working together, the people at the back. And, and the, the other great revelation is that Ed Harris says that his job is to control every aspect of this society in balance, including population control. So what starts this revolution off is the people from the front come and take two small children mm -hmm. and never to be seen or heard from again. And then they do the rabble rabble and then Tilda Swinton comes and gives this Ordo Ab Chaos speech. Right. And she says, you are in your preordained place. <clears throat> Everything in its place. Shoes don't go on your head. They go on your feet. You are the mm -hmm. feet. I'm the head. Yeah. And so everything in its place. They call Mr. Mason. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, so you have this Gnostic God, the engine, know your place. Um, and you must overthrow the class system mm -hmm. on the train. To what end, though? Right, so the idea is, and, and again, Curtis represents the idealistic, uh, noble, honorable, freedom-fighting revolutionary who is being manipulated. Mm -hmm. And he's double-crossed by the John Hurt character who's you know the, the leader, the old wise sage leading the poor people. But he's daily in communication with the front of the train, Ed Harris. Mm -hmm. And you have this weird drug they call... Chronal, so made by industrial waste and stuff. And by the way, thank you, John Goris. You're you're right. I did watch Dead End Drive In, and I I loved it. It was a great overlooked '80s movie. I don't know how I missed it, but I had a lot of fun. And we will eventually uh, get to Dead End Drive In. But thank you. I did I did watch it. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, entire cars and sections of the train are dedicated to getting high and just. Like Decadence, now. partying, yeah. right? So it represents, it's an allegory for society. There's a and water supply is this... car. Yeah. So this is the steps that he has to go through to get to the front is like the water supply, the fruit trees, the aquarium. And they talk about having sustainable, balanced ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And while they're eating sushi and talking about we have the perfect number of fish to sustain all of this. Meanwhile, everybody in the caboose is starving and they, they eat jello poop, basically. <laughs> yeah. Recycled black jello poop. Yeah. Um, they have a classroom car, the indoctrination part of it. Right, so they take right. the kids and then indoctrinate them. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, this was weird. They tell them the we the Wilford story, the Wilford Industries. They worship the engine because it's eternal, and he built this train because he knew that the end of the world was coming. Mm -hmm. So how did he know that? He just we don't know. Okay. So this is based on a comic book. I don't remember. I've never read yeah. the comic book. So. He knew the earth would get frozen somehow, so he made the snow piercer to get fresh. Well, he was probably in on it. He was probably part right. of the... Right. So he probably thought he could... Control it. Yeah. There's the techno train, the druggy car. They... Oh, okay. So you, then you come to hear the story of Curtis, Captain America, and his experience is that when they first got on the train, they were eating each other. Mm-hmm. So they had to be reduced to cannibalism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then instead of eating the little ones, some people started cutting off their limbs. And so you have all of these people. Do you remember? Like mm -hmm. even William Hurt was missing. Mm -hmm. limbs. Um, and and the, the, the point too is that there's a journey, a process that Curtis goes through. Right, so Curtis comes from the bottom and goes all the way to the top, and then when he gets there, Ed Harris is like, "You won, um, now you get to run the train." Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like you went through the alchemical processing; you've come to enlightenment. Because he's trying to teach them that we're all still prisoners, no matter what your station, because mm -hmm. this is a Gnostic. Right, you know. Ed Harris is the bumbling, evil creator god. Yes. Yeah. So we must be balanced. The population must be called sometimes. And this is what the entire revolution was about. Um, individual units killing other individual units. And let's see. The engine is eternity. Gnostic matter is a prison. He wants Curtis to take his place. It was like that movie Mind Warp. 
when she goes through is that the jello home, is it jello poop or is it people that's re recycled that's what i they didn't really explicitly well say people in the chat ken is saying it's uh people recycle people and yes this is a technocracy so they worship the train right they think mm-hmm. the techno they think technology is what's going to save them it's very ayn rand too like that and metropolis they're like ken says and, and then it's actually what's enslaving people mm-hmm. and so the destruction of the train is what leads to the return to a more natural order and natural state and like i was saying it was like that movie might well be- remember i'm sorry but the the, the geoengineering is also a technology yeah. And that's what messed everything up. Yeah. Mind Warp. Yeah. Which is a, a good B movie, by the way, with Bruce <clears> Campbell. <throat> if you've not seen Mind Warp, it's a uh, Gnostic slash, it's got esoteric occult stuff in it. We should do Mind Warp, actually, because the the father ends up running a satanic cult in the movie. But that's all in a virtual world. So it's like the Matrix before the Matrix, actually. Yeah. And it, it, might, actually, some, it might actually be a William Gibson um, story. If there were some scenes in island that were derivative of matrix 2 with the people in the pod sure yeah. um let me because i think uh now now that i think about it mine work might be a william gibson story go ahead so you get to the very end and the last thing that we don't know is what happened to the two small children and he almost got him to take over his place so the engineer almost got curtis captain america mm. To go with his plan and take over as the captain of the train, mm-hmm. except he found out that there are children replacing parts of the train that are broken down and that can't be replaced. So they have to put humans down there because they're very small and they're mind controlled to just do one little task. So the train itself is starting to be run on human blood sweat. Yes. Okay. Right? That makes sense. Right. Um, so that's what makes him come out of his like decision to be the captain and blow up the mm-hmm. train. By the way, guys, I'll put it in the chat if you're looking for a fun uh, B movie to watch that is uh, along these lines. Here is the trailer for Mind Warp, and uh, Bruce Campbell does a good job in that one. It's pretty good. It's mm-hmm. a pretty good B movie. So you he blows it all up, stops the train. Most people die or. One little girl and one little boy survive, and they see the polar bear of good fortune, meaning they can survive out. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So you want to read the super chats? And by the way, thank okay. you guys. A lot of fun. Uh, in part two, we will do Back to the Future 2, Running Man, Soylent Green, and Terminator. yet another viewing of Terminator. I know we've done Terminator maybe two years ago, so we'll have fun redoing that. But uh, Terminator takes, what's the last year? The of the dates so as you guys know this is chronological dystopia and the last so robocop is 2028 terminator 2029 so that'll be fun so Mm -hmm. all the way up to 2029 uh you want to read these super chats yeah okay uh so let's see son of tiamat there you go son of tiamat Unrelated, but what are your thoughts on NRX writer Curtis Yarvin bastardizing the word antonomian antonomian to mean left wing while saying that pronomian equates to being right wing? According to him, Nazis were right wing because they were pronomian. So uh, everybody always asks me about neo reaction writers. I don't know much about this other than that people have mentioned it a lot. Um, I mean, the word antinomian just means uh, anti-law in a theological context. So I'm not sure exactly why it would relate to politics, except in maybe a loose sense that um, liberalism is, you know, revolutionary in its ethos and that pro-nomian, pro-law is right wing. Yeah, I think those are kind of um, overly simplistic characterizations. So... Beyond that, I just don't know enough about Neo Reaction to comment, but thank you for that, Tiamat. Um, Ribranium has $5. Jay and Jamie, did you catch the interview with Paul Verhoeven where he says Robocop is a Jesus allegory? He dies, is resurrected, and walks on water. Verhoeven literally calls Robocop the American Jesus. Wow. No, I didn't know that. Where does he walk on water? I don't know. 
It makes sense, though. Yeah. I could see that. Yeah, uh, Verhoeven's a strange guy. He likes these, these well, that's kind of an out there idea, but I guess it makes sense. And the TJ Lee. He's man, one. he's, so instead of uh, fully man, fully God, fully man, fully tech. Mm-hmm. There you go. Yeah. Bingo. Right brain him again. Um, also, Robocop gets right how the military or the military industrial complex has sold their equipment to law enforcement. MRAP vehicles are everywhere in law MRAP, enforcement. Yep. At all levels. SWAT. Right? Yeah, exactly. Great point. And that comes up in uh, The Warrior Cop. There was a book written uh, that that traces this whole thing out called The Warrior Cop. Exactly. Exactly. And that's done on purpose to socially engineer us into the technocracy. Mm, Taffy D74, $5. Thank you. Mick Hale, the King of Kings, ten dollars. Tom Coombe is two inches tall and only needs a can of soda to have to ride in. I hope this ten dollars gets him the most decked out soda can for his Coombness. Do you remember that Buffy the Vampire? You could imagine a little. It's be like Days of Thunder, but with RC, like a little RC and a little, little bitty Tom. You know what Days of Thunder the movie? Yeah. Yeah, and he could a little bitty Tom Coombe can ride in a little RC, and I could control him. Yes. Exactly. That'd be, uh, that sounds awesome. That made me think of that Buffy the Vampire Slayer where the their fears are just this tiny little guy and she, all she has to do is stomp on them. Right, because yeah. then we were laughing at how dumb that was of being, that's just like the end of It. Yes. So the whole, all we had to do to be It was make fun of him. <laughs> that was so dumb, mm-hmm. dude. Um, Tom Coon, $5. <laughs> the actual, to- it's Tom, Tom Cruise Coon. himself is here. No, it's Tom Coon. Okay. Okay. God bless Jay. Two questions. Would you debate Jake the metaphysician, metaphysician and with regards to the tag argument, couldn't one argue that transcendentals like logic are self-foundational and therefore don't require God as a self-referencing foundation? No, because just to say that there's a higher degree of uh, metaphysical abstract principles doesn't explain how they're grounded. You need an intentional personal being. That's part of the argument. Um, and no, I don't have any interest in interacting with Jake anymore because we had a debate scheduled. Um, he wanted to change the criteria. He went and made a bunch of, you know, expose, call you out videos. And at that point, I just move on. So I'm um, not interested. But uh, thank you for that, Tom Coombe. Go ahead, Nano Nerd. Uh, Nano Nerd, where might the book of Revelation fit in the dystopian movie timeline? What stage of technology might we be at the end of times? Judge Dredd, what's too far? Star <laughs> Star Wars, what do we do? Great show as always. Thanks, God bless. Um, I don't know. I don't know that we know how exactly Revelation will go down. I mean, as we get closer to the end, it'll be clearer, as the saints say. So, but uh, so I couldn't give you any kind of play by play, except to say that obviously Revelation, you know, nineteen and twenty, um, clearly refer to the end end. Okay, so, uh, but as to technology being predicted, yeah, I think there's going to be something to do with uh, tracking, um, you know, uh, keeping up with everybody's purchases and this kind of stuff. That's definitely what's talked about with, you know, the Mark of the Beast and all that. But uh, when exactly that's coming and if that's, you know, next year, I don't know. Okay, is that it? All right, thank you guys. If you want to watch part two, uh, subscribe to uh, Jay's analysis at the link. You can go and uh, join our archive section members area. You get access to everything. The last five, six years, hundreds of essays, talks, interviews, lectures, on and on and on. Uh, You can go shout out to the ROK Finn. We're on The Rock, as you know. Follow us there and uh, get the books if you want. And also go get some of that legit, she legit mushrooms at chalk.com to uh, help you get your mojo back. These are uh, obviously health-based mushrooms, nothing to do with psychedelic mushrooms or anything like that. Uh, they have hundreds of five-star reviews.